Welcome to the Excel Cast. I'm Jonathan Kuskiski at the University of Michigan Excel program, and today I'm speaking with composer Ted Hearn, who's here. Hello, Hello welcome. It's great to have you. Great to be here. Uh, Ted is here for a performance uh, on the UMS series by two groups, A Far Cry, based out of Boston, and Roomful of Teeth, a vocal octet. Um, and they're p performing two of your pieces, and you're actually performing as a vocalist as well. Be That's right, I'm singing with Roomful of Teeth. Which is exciting. Mm -hmm, very much. Um, great, so we're gonna talk today about sort of your career, in particular the sort of mosaic life of a composer in the 21st century, mm -hmm. um, and hopefully get into some other interesting related topics. So, okay, so you're obviously an in-demand com composer. Um, you're also on the faculty of University of Southern California. That's right. Right? Um, but you also have a handful of other projects that, it, you, know, that you engage with, um, in addition to these other roles. Yeah. So can you talk us through a little <laughs> bit, I'd, maybe let's start on the, the meta level and then we'll come down to the micro level. So what does that mean in terms of sort of balancing these different aspects? Do you have a routine? You know, do you have like composing time <laughs> that you set aside? How do you uh, balance these different I'm activities? I'm always in need of more composing time. I don't know the, uh, it's, you know, I have a, um, I have a family now too with uh, two young kids, which is just oh, intense. Yeah. So that's, so that eats up a lot of time, of course, as does the um, the you know the teaching gig, which is a wonderful teaching gig mm -hmm. at, at USC. But um, but you know, so I, so I am right now like very much struggling to get enough composing time. Um, luckily, I'm taking the year off next year from teaching, so oh, I'll really okay. be able to focus on that. But um, but you're right. I mean, it's it's uh, it's hard to get composing time, and it's hard to uh, to keep everything straight. But I'm 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 someone who's always sort of like taken on a little bit too much, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, I have a lot that I want to say and. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't say no to things if I want to do them, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, I'm ambitious. So I have projects that I, that I haven't made yet that I want to make. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I th you know, I think it's important to like always remember that to just keep to keep piling on. If, if you have things to say, like keep pushing toward that, you know. So say yes more than saying no. Right? Well, I mean, it's different for everybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, there's certainly sometimes I probably should have said no or should have said like, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. But um, but I do have a hard time saying no. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that um, on a kind of micro level. Yeah, sure. So I'm thinking about um, you know the, these different types of projects. Let's say you have a commission. A con you're part of this other uh, collective called Sleeping Giant with mm -hmm. five other composers. Let's say you have a project with them, and you know you're compl completing this piece that's part of that group, and then you have a large orchestral commission on your plate, but you also have some shorter, s smaller scale pieces on a shorter timeline. You know, what does that mean in terms of not just carving out composing time, but in kind of juggling the different musical ideas that you're working with? I mean, is it, is there, I'm, and I, I don't, I know I'm sure that it's a unique thing to every composer, but I guess what I'm wondering more specifically is how that has changed with the increase in volume of activity that you've, you're managing. That's a great question. I mean, <clears throat> you know, for me, I'm 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 very much interested in the way that the ways in which like particular ideas can take on completely new life forms when the medium is a little bit different, you know. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I like about having different types of projects, you know, like I have a I have a band with Philip White. We have a, like a, a vocal electronics duo called Are We Who Are We, yeah, yeah. you know. And I also have a group that plays sort of like you know, experimental, notated, like indie rock type of shit a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. And then also, like, I write orchestral music, I write choral music, I write vocal, you know, like other types of things. I work with Sleeping Giant, as you say, mm -hmm. right? So part of the thing, part, part of what's really um, fun about um, working with these different mediums is to see the way that um, certain musical ideas uh, can morph and how they can live in, in different mediums, you know? So like this piece for a Far Cry that they're playing, yep. um, you know, that's a that, that's a piece called Law of Mosaics, and it's um, it's made up of, uh, of, you know, the whole piece is like a patchwork that's constructed of pre-existing bits of material from right. other places, right? So, so one of the movements um, started as essentially like a transcription of a, of, a, of a song that Philip and I played in our band, you know? Um, and, you know, uh, Philip White is an incredible Musician who um, he he plays uh, mixer feedback, so no one put feedback through a mixer, right? And and uh, the the way that he's able to control these timbres is just like incredible, and I'm uh, so lucky so lucky to be able to work with him. And I was so inspired by some of the sounds that he was coming up with, especially on this this one tune. And I was just thinking like, okay, well, what would you know? What kind of project would it be to try to like um, have a string orchestra, an entirely acoustic ensemble? you know, with these like old string instruments, you know, like how to, how could I like access some of the, not just the notes and the rhythms, not just the energy that Philip was playing, but mm -hmm. like the, but the the actual, um, 
like palette of you know especially high frequency sounds that he was that he was um, that he was playing with like could I access those and control them for a completely different medium you know and of course that piece you know isn't the same thing at all as what Philip and I did but um, but it, it was like a jumping off point you know mm -hmm. like that the diversity of mediums was a real jumping off point. Yeah, so that, that's an interesting point, and, and this is one thing I was hopeful that we were gonna get to, which is this idea of how these different projects can influence each other, and how sort of uh, as multimodal, um, I like to, I actually think about it as the ambidextrous musician, because I think often in classical music, and I'm a, a pianist, speaking from a classical pianist perspective, we're often some of the worst at this in terms of kind of specializing our skills, mm -hmm. and sometimes specializing our listening habits, right? And so, um, we've heard that in many uh, previous episodes, but something you're mentioning here as well, this idea that having these sort of multiple ac platforms for making music yeah. in different modalities with different traditions, different types of sort of processes in terms of creating the music can influence each other. Yeah. So, uh, well, can you talk a little bit more about that? Of and, course. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that, the ambidextrous musician. It's a great phrase. I mean, I think we're more and more we're ambidextrous um, or omnivorous uh, yeah. uh, listeners, right? right. I mean, um, we have access to all sorts of music now, of course, and even just the way that we listen, you know, I mean, this I like I'm sounding like an old person saying this now, but like, you know, we are able to listen to whatever music we want right. in whatever way that we want, right. you know? And um, I can't emphasize enough how much that has, um, I think that influences everyone's listening and influences the way that we receive music and it should influence the way that we write music, you yeah. know? Um, not to say that, uh, and uh, not to say that everyone should try to be a specialist in everything that wouldn't make any sense. Right. It would be completely inauthentic, right? Mm -hmm. But but like, you know, I consider like, you know, my musical voice is like in some way a uh, it's part of it's like a blueprint that is made up of a bunch of different influences, right? And those influences are entirely in my own, you know? I mean, yeah. I have a lot of I, you know, overlapping Venn diagram with lots of other musicians, but it's but it, the whole combination is not quite the same, you know? Yeah. Because like I grew up singing in a choir and because like my mom was an opera singer, but I also, you know, like really got into hip hop in high school or whatever. You know, I don't know whatever that is, like there's so many different parts of that, right? Yeah. So um so so whatever that blueprint is, like trying to um, trying to flesh that out, um, and and expose it and challenge it, like mm -hmm. that's what I think my project as a composer is, you know, rather yeah. than like trying to get into one one specific um, one specific genre, you know. And I think right. that like performers probably there's probably some some analog to that with composer with uh, performers as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. Well, for sure. And I think that that's a, that's that's where you can get into some of the most interesting spaces. Yeah. You know, that sort of in between. I'm thinking actually a little bit about. Um, I believe it's the last movement of the piece you were just speaking about. The Far Cry is going to play. Oh, mm -hmm. It's all about sort of the the, the space between um, uh, tones and non tones, right? The sort of oh well, yeah. I mean, in a way, right? It, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Well, there's a uh, that's called the warp and the woof. But yes, there's yeah. a yeah. There there are um, you know there's like a chord progression that's right. played where yeah. they start with a crunch tone and yeah, yeah. and sort of end on a pitch. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So. Keep an eye out for that. Oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> but as a side note, can we talk a little more about friction? Because I think that's yeah. what, that's what I'm get, getting at here is this idea of friction, right? The sort of spaces in between that often are uncomfortable mm -hmm. places to live. And I think about that if we take the analogy in career, career building, I think we tend to rely on the things we're more comfortable doing, the skills that we have, rather than the areas where we feel like we need to push ourselves because, um, for example, I talk about budgeting, right? So budgeting is probably one of the least, you know, uh, attractive topics for, for, for students to come to, right? Yeah. Unless it's framed within the context of a project or something that they really want to make happen. Because if it comes a mean to a creative end, then all of a sudden it doesn't have the same kind of um, aura to it, if you will. So, um, but with that in mind, so, you know, you've talked about seizing opportunities and, you know, being smart about taking opportunities, but being open and sometimes pushing yourself to take opportunities that might feel like they push you over and then it, and rise into the challenge. But let's back up a little bit because I think a lot of times um, students are struggling with creating opportunities and this sort of friction between, you know, taking on opportunities that might be good for them, but at the same time being concerned about how that opportunity might conflict with certain, would that distract them from other artistic goals? Yeah. Can you talk about the balance of what it means to be sort of pushing forward and taking on exciting opportunities and kind of retaining your sort of artistic and authentic goals? Maybe, maybe you sure. found a balance. Well, no, I mean, what, well, what I was talking about before with the pushing, yeah. pushing too hard is literally just about time, you right. know, and yeah. like, yeah. And like um, you know, if, if someone comes to me with an opportunity to write some music, if I yeah. want to do it, I will like 
basically always say yes. Right. And, and, uh, and, and sometimes I get myself into trouble because it's like there's just only so many hours yeah. in a day, right? Yeah. But I think, um, but you, you seem to be hinting at this really interesting idea of friction between like the, you know, the development of your own artistic goals and your artistic right. voice versus, um, versus, you know, the more, maybe the more rigid goals of, you know, a particular opportunity that might come along. I know for composers, for me, this is, this has been a, an issue sometimes and I can, you know, there are, there are, there are so many opportunities for composers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, some of them, you know, there, there are some, some like really, really great ones and there are some ones that are, you know, not, not quite as helpful, but there's a lot out there. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole culture of applying to programs, you know, and yeah. then being accepted to things. And there's like a whole culture of prizes too in, in classical yeah. composition anyway. And, um, you know, I think it can be challenging to, to not just play to that, you know, yeah. Because the you know the irony is that the thing that um, the thing that almost everyone listens for is this is a, is a fresh, original type of uh, t- type of voice you know type of yep. way of using uh, using music you know or or, um, or writing music you know so um, so I don't know I mean um, for me it's always been uh, really important to to spearhead my own projects yep. you know. Um, and even when, even now with, with like, you know, ha- having a positive time, it's still like something that's really like uh, important to me. And, uh, you know, I just did a, I just did a show um, last month at National Sawdust that was really, it was about like just a new set of songs I'm working on and really just it, like, it was on my terms. I produced it and mm-hmm. I just wanted to be able to like create a space for this work to live that w- didn't rely on anyone else, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and, and um, you know, uh, you know, uh, earlier, you know, a few years ago, you know, like I, uh, you know, I went into credit card debt on a on a project once because it's like um, it was the thing that I needed to do, you know, and it wasn't yeah. commissioned by anyone, and um, but I needed to make an album of this music, you know, because it was, you know, it was one of the things that I had written that I was most proud of, and I knew that it had to be recorded well yeah. for people to hear it, you know, right. and. Um, you know, so it costs a lot of money, yeah. and it costs like a little more money than I had. But right. like, I knew that it was important. That's what an investment is, you know. Right. And right. um, and and so you know, I don't know. That wouldn't have happened if I was just looking for 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 sources externally you know? created yeah. opportunities, right? Yeah. yeah. So okay, let's talk also then on that note a little bit about um, you know, the relationships that you have built. I mean, we mentioned Sleeping Giant. It's a, group of six of you that all met at Yale Mm -hmm. a lot of the other projects I'd imagine are you know it just makes sense that you're working with people that you've connected with on some level oh, right? Yeah, you totally. want to work with the people that you believe in artistically but also like working with yeah yeah and and, and, and yeah and I mean for me I you know just as a composer like yeah. I I want to write um, I want to write for individuals as much as possible yeah you know so I think like working with a um, working with an orchestra or something that has yeah. That, that has commissioned me, I mean, it's like very um, lucky yeah. to get a commission from an orchestra, but it's also like challenging because who are these people? You know, I don't know yeah. them as individuals. Right. Whereas like, you know, some of the people that I've collaborated with for um, a really long time, yeah. you know, I know I know the things that they love to do mm-hmm. and I know the things that they don't do as much. Yeah. And I'm just someone who's really interested in the tension between those. Mm-hmm. And because they're my friends, they'll sort of like, they will try to do it if I ask them to do it. And I like how, you know, I can, uh, you know, I like what comes out musically when there's someone who's really committed to the music who is being asked, who's being challenged, you know, yeah. but but then who's also being given opportunity to shine. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know, if any of my friends and collaborators are hearing this, they're probably rolling their eyes and <laughs> <laughs> saying that they don't like that part of it. But. Uh, but um, you can't get that with someone you don't know. Right. You know? Um, there's more inherent trust in sort of you know the 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 collaborative process in that way. When you've already had an established right. relationship, you can maybe go further faster in terms of creative space. I right. Don't, I mean, right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Go further faster in, in in terms of creative space. And and also, I mean, it goes without saying, like you know, the people that I love to work with the most, who have given me the most artistically, and who have like, you know, really committed themselves to playing my music well, yeah. and have taught me so much. Like those are people, you know, f- you know. 90% of them, it's like I met at grad school or I met at college or I met at, um, you know, the Bang on the Can Summer Festival was huge for me because mm-hmm. there's some great, you know, I just met some really great musicians there, collaborators who are really into new music. That's great. So um, let's, 
Well, can we just switch gears for a moment? I want to talk about that we mentioned before. You're performing mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow night, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and you're a vocalist. Uh -huh. Okay, uh -huh. so there's a whole other level of balance in this conversation, which is to say that um, uh, you know com you're a composer, but obviously they they called you up and said, "What you know." Ted, we need you. You got to perform. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that's like? And, and oh, well, that was scary. Well, I mean, you know, uh, I'm. Uh, I consider myself um, super lucky um, to be performing with Room Full of Teeth. I mean, I love this group, and their. I love everyone in the group, and their their. Um, you know, the musicianship is at, at such a high level. Yep. You know, um, so it's an honor to be asked, yep. and it's also like a challenge. You know, just as a, as a musician. You know, yep. and I'm and I'm so I'm really grateful for that challenge because. Yep. Um, because you know, I think you, that's how you get better, <laughs> you right? Know? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a balance. I don't know. I mean, I um, the the singing is something that um, I want to um, I want to do more of. You know, it's something that has sort of like fallen off a little bit. I'm also a conductor, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I conducted the Red Light Ensemble in New York for right. seven years, and um, you know, did a lot of sort of freelance conducting of contemporary music there. Um, when I moved to California, I sort of stopped that just because of time, you know. Yeah. But um, but I would I'd really love to pick that up as well. Do you have any just sort of generalized suggestions? Because I'm thinking about this. Obviously, you know, it's important to maintain one's chops, whether mm -hmm. that's as a performer, conductor, or otherwise. Obviously, you've got a busy schedule and you've got lots of other projects. You've yeah. got teaching, you've got composing, you probably have all the miscellaneous admin work that goes into just making sure things are moving forward. Mm -hmm. So what is it like for you in terms of getting this opportunity and saying, oh, yeah, of course, you know, it makes sense for multiple reasons. I want to perform in terms of getting those performance chops ready for this kind of an opportunity, because not every performance requires the same, obviously, sort of um, uh, you know, it's as, as particularly as a vocalist, pianist, I think violinist, mo most instrumentalists can relate to the situation of depending on the performance, you need um, not necessarily more time, but you're not always prepared equally for every opportunity, right? So how do right. you ramp up for whatever that next performance is when you have oh, some I multiple mean, modalities? You know, um, <clears throat> some you know, I think uh, a lot of it is thinking on thinking on my feet <laughs> yeah. and. And uh, being, I mean, for me, the most important thing is being as present as possible in the moment. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I still, um, you know, I think like performance anxiety is a huge, uh, is a huge issue for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call what I have performance anxiety, but I certainly like, you know, there is a, there is like a, there's a marked difference between the way that it feels when you're, when your instrument, when your your ability to interpret through your instrument is just like popping, and mm -hmm. you feel you sound like yourself, you feel like yourself, and you know the and then the feeling when you're you you I don't know you're in your head too much or something, yeah. you know, and uh, and for me like there's nothing like the feeling of performing, mm -hmm. and the you know the feeling like the pressure of performing can really get to the. Um, can really pre preclude me from getting into like from really feeling like myself sometimes, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, um, sure. Performing with my band has been a really great way to um, to uh, to work through that, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's but you know sometimes I still get into that mode in like a in a classical setting because yeah. um, I just don't do it uh, that much, you know. Yeah. Well, I was thinking of this um, amount of iteration, right? So if you're performing every week with a, in a particular yeah. know, genre of music or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like anything else. You develop a certain level of sort of. Um, Psych psychological, yeah, psychological preparation for what it means mm -hmm. to be on stage in that kind of venue, in with that kind of group, with that kind of formality and protocol. And right. uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, that I've, I've we've talked with lots of other folks who are dealing with the same kind of thing. They might play in eight different, you know, ensembles, and it's that switch right. that you have to get used to making quickly and efficiently. Right, right, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's a great skill. And if you're a composer, you're thinking about it even at a deeper level, potentially. If you're performing your own work. Oh too, my God! Yeah. Well, that's a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah, it's very weird performing your own work, and yeah. and um, you know, with with, with this roof with uh, Roomful, I mean, I um, I performed it with them uh, a few nights ago. And I've worked with them a bunch on the piece, but um, okay. but never in that role, right? Mm -hmm. So it was uh, it was totally disorienting because <laughs> I was used to hearing hearing eight people and really like getting you know being able to really control or like I mean really at least have a have a sense of the flow of the whole thing, right. you know, and really get into thinking about it that way and viewing it yeah. holistically. It's so different, like being a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so <laughs> that's that's hard. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, just um, before we run out of time, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for being here, making oh, the time of course, to talk anytime. to us. Thank you. Um, and any so again, most of our audience these are young professional students mm -hmm. here at the university or recent grads who are out there. 
Um, and just a, as parting thoughts, do you have any sort of generalized tips maybe, um, let's say for those students who are looking to create those opportunities, and specifically about prioritizing. So I would say that you know there's a hierarchy of sort of activities. There's the creative work, composing, practicing, performing. There's all these ancillary kind of work that goes into it. The email, the admin, the sort of other critical thinking, strategic thinking that goes into yeah. a project. And a lot of the time um, we get feedback from students saying, you know, I just, it's hard to initiate that first project because I don't feel like I know how to juggle all those things. Right. So would you say just dive in or what are some of the things you might you tell know, somebody who's facing that? I, everyone is different. You know, yeah. I mean, um, you know, uh, I think that we were, you know, we were talking about um, David Skidmore. I mean, yeah, from the third, third Coast Percussion. Yeah. He's an incredible percussionist, good friend of mine, right? And 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 seeing him uh, organize mm -hmm. is, it's like, it's like watching an artist, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's like, like, he, but he, but he's able. He's someone who's able to set up, you know, who who can think very practically about the future yeah. and like set up the frame, and then is able to excel as an artist mm -hmm. within that frame, you know, yeah. because because he's like, oh, I built this house and I'm in it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the opposite. <laughs> I think that I don't, if, you know, I get really overwhelmed thinking about that, but I um, I do get a lot of energy from like creation and from mm -hmm. things happening, right? So yeah. so, you know, and I think my friends will probably back this up. I will. Create, I will create an opportunity, like just and say, like the opportunity being like we're meeting together and we're gonna make music. Yeah. And you know, I'm trying to get better at this, but mm -hmm. in the past, some of my like you know structural strengths have not really been built up. Yeah. You know, so there'll be moments that are really awkward almost all the time where it's just like, oh, you didn't think of this one aspect, or mm -hmm. um, we don't. Where's the money coming from again? You know, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. And there's like so, always sort of an element of like we're improvising. Um, and that's you know, I'm not saying that's good. I would like to get better at that. I think I have gotten somewhat better. But uh, but then when that situation happens and there's music being made, you know that's when then I all of a sudden I get so much more energy ah. and I'm able to create much more, you know. Right, right, right. And then I'll just go and go and go, mm -hmm. and then then like work is created, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now I need an like admin helper for sure, <laughs> you know. But um, but I know that for me like it's actually more important to just to just make the work, yeah. and uh, and if you can create some sort of forum for that to happen, you know. Like, I don't know, I just started, like, I think I produced my first show when I was, like, a freshman in college. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, I'm not saying it was good, but it was, like, definitely, like, yeah. people were in a room together making music. And um, that's, you know, that's where you have to start. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure I paid everyone, like, 50 bucks or less, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, to start. But, um, but luckily I had people who were willing to contribute. And I could try to give them something in return even if it wasn't. Right cash money, yeah. you know? Well, it's great to, a couple of big takeaways from that. One is to know yourself and know your process yeah. and to not let whatever, because we all have certain areas where we feel like we're more comfortable or less comfortable in terms of these other skill sets. Yeah. And it's easy to let the, the gaps hold us back yeah. and to not let them hold you back is I think adventurous and critical. And the second thing I'd say is, you know, we would never expect somebody after their first piano lesson to play Mozart concerto in right. front of people. Right. And so we, I think we have to also honor the fact that we need the same iterative kind of practice in doing in creating these opportunities for ourselves Absolutely. and to learn over time and to accept that just like we do with our own creative output we're going to improve and refine and go in different right. directions and learn through that process it's so hard though when you're when you're an artist and you're creating you're just yeah. starting because you are inspired by this great art you right. know i mean and you're and you're like oh i want to be like this you yeah. know and then the first first time you make it it's just not, not going to be yeah, like that yeah. you're not good yet yeah. you know yeah um so i mean i know it's obvious but it's also like it can definitely stop you from making in the first right. place which would defeat the point. Right. But I think that goes back to the point of having a group you can trust to support you so you can support each yes. other yeah. and, and grow together. So, well, yeah. listen, it's been great to talk with you. Totally. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. We're looking forward to your uh, performance of, of your music and by you tomorrow night great. at UMS and cool. look forward to seeing more about what you'll okay. do in Thanks the future. So Thanks. Appreciate it.